So, well, uh, we are super excited to be here. Jasmine and I are. This is a passion that we have. Um, and our friendship and journey together started almost three years to three years ago, two years ago. It feels um, like forever. Three. Like I know. <laughs> it feels like I've always known you. Um, yep. Yeah. So, um, and one of the things that we've discovered is that we have very similar thoughts and behaviors, but what we will share with you tonight is the motivations behind those are way different. Um, and so that's to us what makes the Enneagram different than other personality uh, assessment tools uh, that you will see out there. So as uh, we were introduced, my name is Teresa Kropichka. I'm an Agile coach at Nelnet. And go ahead, Jasmine. And I am Jasmine Beanie, and I am an uh, Scrum Master at Nelnet. So we uh, I've been at Nelnet now for about seven years. And um, yeah, we're going to start talking about learning the why behind our behaviors. So, And I want to give you a heads up. This is the first time we've presented with Google Slides. So uh, it's a little bit of an experiment with us. So hopefully the, this works through and, and works smoothly for everyone. So yes. Awesome. So let's talk through what we're going to be discussing today and then for the next roughly half hour, 40 minutes. So Teresa and I are going to talk a little bit about us, a little bit more about us and our journey. Um, then we're going to talk about what motivates you as a person and what that looks like. What is the Enneagram and very high level of what the Enneagram is, the types uh, the nine types of the Enneagram. Then we're going to get more in depth in our journeys with the Enneagram and what brought us here and what work we've done in our workshop so far and the data we've collected. So that's what we'll talk about today. And I just wanted to make mention that if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we will definitely address them towards the end. Um, we found it very difficult to condense <laughs> <laughs> this because there's so much information out there. So we hope we, we can touch on everything today that, you know, that's, that's important to know about the Enneagram. So, all right, about us. Let's see. I just realized that my whole screen is taken up. I got so excited, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So as an Agile coach and Scrum Master, Teresa and I have regularly coached teams and individuals introspectively. Whether it wasn't, whether it was in a one-on-one -on -one coaching session or resolving a misunderstanding, we always coached in line with some basics, like assume positive intent. I'm sure you've all heard these, assume positive intent, try to focus on the issue versus the people. Maybe there are uncommunicated expectations, you know, the things that we all have been taught to coach on and help teams with. We would also perform various team activities involving personality tests so that each person could get a better understanding of where they and others may be coming from to try to create that empathy and understanding between team members. Then one day, Teresa mentioned she had heard about the Enneagram and that we would probably be the same type on the Enneagram tool because we were so similar in our personalities and behaviors. We called our, each other we would say we were twinning, but because she was from the Midwest and I was from the city, the cultural differences were there between us. But other than that, we were the same. So, of course, we would be the same Enneagram type, right? Well, we will come back to our personal journey with the Enneagram later in the presentation. But after a lot of work, we realized that we were not the same type because we had a different driving force, different motivations behind all of our actions and behaviors. It has also enhanced our friendship tenfold because now I understand the motivations and behind her behaviors. And we can go through that when we talk about our journeys. We have some funny stories. So with this, so with this knowledge and our passion for helping others, we knew we wanted to share a system of self-awareness with everyone we possibly could. The way it helped us understand ourselves was unlike anything we had ever experienced, and we knew this would have a positive impact on teams and individuals. Imagine if each person understood their motivations, the why they do what they do. The individual self-awareness has the greatest impact on our behaviors, and if every, everyone knew their motivations, or if enough people knew their motivations and their team members, imagine the impact on communication and empathy it would have on the team. And Teresa and I have seen this impact firsthand, and it's beautiful. 
In the future, Teresa and I will be investing in becoming certified Enneagram coaches. It's actually a thing. You could become an actual certified Enneagram coach so that we can continue to serve others with more depth and understanding of the Enneagram. And so with that, I also do want to add that what we go over today, we have learned based on our own research and our passion for the Enneagram. Um, and we hope in the future to be able to be more versed and, and actually be certified to, to do more. All right. So you may be wondering why we are using the term motivation versus behavior or personality. Personality. Oh, personality. <laughs> Let's go there next. <laughs> All right. So motivation, as defined by the Oxford Dictionary, is the reason or reasons one has for acting or behaving in a particular way. Our motivation is, is instinctive. Oh, in uh, my love, my love. Is instinctive in us and never changes. It has been with us since birth. And as our behavior changes and our personalities grow, our motivations always remain the same. We have all heard of various personality tests, such as Myers-Briggs, Disc, disc, strength finders, Clifton strengths, etc. And they provide us with a sense of where our personalities and behaviors are today. Many organizations find tools. They find these tools helpful and useful in setting people up for success because they help them see where they are today, that person where they are today, and how to use these behaviors and personalities to best serve the organization. Now, while these systems are very useful to identify our current personality state, they don't help us understand the motivation behind our behaviors that created that personality in the first place. They also do not provide us with tools to grow in areas that may, we may be weakest in. And, you know, many of us, we have, uh, we've gone and looked at self-help tools out online, we've read books, and they tell us to do these five things, try these eight things, and for more self-awareness or growth in your behavior, right, do these, all these things. Well, what if those improvements on behavior don't align with your core motivations? Consider this dynamic within your teams and organizations. I mean, we we're saying, hey, you can do X, Y, and Z to be more self-aware and grow, but what if it goes against their core motivation? Teresa and I have coached people on behaviors with wings along the way during our careers. We have also seen the life-altering impact when we coach on motivation, especially when each individual can understand and establish empathy around each team member's motivation. Now, how do you determine your motivation? Well, we found that the Enneagram is the most powerful and ancient system to use in order to determine your motivation. So what is the Enneagram? is next. Now, this is a system that allows you to understand the motivations behind what we say and do. By understanding these things in yourself and in those you interact with, in theory, this can help you work through and reduce misunderstandings, feelings of rejection, and anger. The Enneagram reveals to us our motivations behind our behaviors, providing context of the why behind the what. Understanding this helps you replace judgment and with compassion and allows you to have better relationships. The Enneagram acts as a guide that can help you navigate through your challenges to help you avoid them in the first place. Yeah, true that. Sorry, I'm reading this and I always get this like, oh, yes, I know. <laughs> oh, so the Enneagram promotes self-awareness. It promotes self-nurturing love. Nurturing self-love, mindfulness, boosting your sense of compassion, and improving your relationships. And there's one tidbit that you should know. If you know the Enneagram and it has helped you, you have a responsibility to treat people the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. So now I'm going to send it off to Teresa to go quickly go over the nine types. And this is super quick because there's so much. There's so many books. So uh, Jasmine and I will talk a little bit about the workshop we've been doing at our workplace. And um, we literally could talk hours about this stuff. So, <laughs> so and we and I just have, just, so just, just right yes. before you do, we do have, I want to make sure, cause I'd asked questions earlier and people raised their hand to answer those oh. questions, but I see hands raised now and I want to make sure they don't have a, that that's a still from an earlier <laughs> conversation and not right now. <laughs> So Pala, Pala B, uh, Kara and Mary, if, if, if any of you guys have questions, feel free. Otherwise, um, if you want to take your hands down, then that's fine too. Just make sure if folks want to ask a question, you can raise your hand to bring that in. 
Okay, hands are going down, looks like. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for the interruption. Nope, Go thank right you. Ahead. I had noticed that too. I didn't know if it was from previous or not. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So today we're going to just introduce you to each type. So this is at the highest level of information. So just a tidbit. Um, as we go through this, you might uh, feel something about one of the things that we talk about, and you may not. Everyone's recognition of their type takes a different journey. So it can start as a test that you take online that will give you an idea where to explore more because we'll talk a little bit about um, or mention that tests can be kind of gamed if you ever take those tests like you take it from the perspective of who you want to be and not necessarily who you truly are because that takes some acknowledgement. Um, so it may not always give you the right and the right type, but it helps you guide your journey along the way. Sometimes people are in denial of their true selves and may reject a type. So if you read about a type and you're like, it makes you angry or, or um, it's like, that's definitely not me. That might be some self-reflection coming up. Or you might have an emotional response. Um, so when I read about my type, like I get very emotional about it. And um, I've always come between two types and I read one. I'm like, yeah, I can see myself there. And then I read the other one. I'm like, no, that's me. I get really emotional. So just know that we're just briefly reviewing them tonight. You may or may not align with something, uh, but this is just really for an introduction. So something to think about as we walk through these. Um, every number has a special gift to bring to their environment that no other gift or number can. Um, part, and I say that because the intent in knowing this is not to get rid of the worst part of you. You'll, we'll, we'll talk about things and you're like, ooh, that doesn't sound very nice. Um, so the numbers have the best parts of you and the worst parts of you. And that's where se true self-knowledge comes from, is that we're not always at our best selves. Um, but every number has a special gift that they bring. There is no one that's better than the other. Um, Again, it's about knowing what's the worst part of you and the best part of you. So really embracing all of who you are. Um, and then you will see a little bit of yourself in each type. The difference is to what extent you will go to fulfill your motivation or avoid your fears. So you may see behaviors like, oh, yeah, I do that. Oh, yeah, I do that. But it's really about to what extent do you go to fulfill your motivation that will align you with a certain type. So we're going to talk about these types in what they call the intellectual centers or the intelligence centers, and there are three of them. So we will highlight each number in the Enneagram by grouping them in these centers because we feel there's a lot of value in recognizing um, where you might fall within the Enneagram based off of this. So the first one we're going to talk about is the body center. It's also known as the instinctual center, and it receives its instinctual energy from um, the convict some kind of conviction that needs to be acted on. And a common thread between these types is their desire for respect, comfort, and most importantly, control. So again, don't think of these as negative things. These are just the things that are motivating them, things that they, they are trying to keep within their control. The types in the center are motivi motivated by the um, desire to remain autonomous, which creates the need for control. So that's their, their base motivation in this intelligence center. Uh, something to think about as we go through these is you might be a body center type if you make decisions by your gut instinct. So if you say, I feel it in my gut or I'm going with my gut, you might be a body center type. So we're going to start with eights. So eights are called the protector or the challenger. And their motivation is that they want to be self-reliant and able to control their situation or environment. And it would very distinctly say situation or environment. It's not the people that they want to control. It's the situation or environment they're in. They are, their motivating fear is they don't want to be, they are in fear of being harmed, controlled, or manipulated by others. Um, so eights show up, uh, they fight for justice and for the weak. They have difficulty being vulnerable. Uh, ch they challenge ideas 
to see what will stand and they naturally fill in any vacuums of power. So um, it is also said one of the most misunderstood Enneagram types is type eight women because they're very strong female types um, that get misunderstood as, you know, not sensitive or caring or empathetic. They are those things. It's just that the things that they're, they're, they're trying to control their environment and their situation. So they may come across more abra uh, abrasive than they mean to. So the next one in this type is called nines. The type nine is the mediator or the peacemaker. Their motivation is to create inner peace and stability. They fear conflict, both inner and out and both inner and outer chaos. So they go out of their way to keep peace in their life. Um, they really go out, uh, do not like conflict down to the point of some people won't even make a decision about where to eat because they don't want their, and that's a very simplistic example because of what we're talking about here, but they may be the people in your life that never want to make a decision around what to eat or where to eat. So uh, nines show up, they can see some of the best things about them is they see both sides of anything. They really are a mediator. They can see your point. They can see your point. So they can see both sides. Uh, they do repress anger in order to keep peace. So they hold on to anger just to make sure that they don't have conflict. So they have, may have some unresolved anger. Uh, they maintain two boundaries, internal and external, and they find it easier to merge with others. So, find, you know, kind of like taking on other people's ideas and hobbies, et cetera, uh, because that keeps peace and, and, and there's no conflict with that. And they, and they're, depending on what books you read, they refer to sloth um, or the, the sin of sloth around the nine because they don't want the energy or the conflict with realizing their own um, dreams. So, so that's why it's a little bit easier to merge with others in that aspect. Um, so then we go to ones, and we, we purposely start with eights um, in the body center uh, to kind of go through because eights seem to be the most impatient to find out what their type is. So <laughs> most uh, educators will start with an eight on, on the Enneagram. So ones are called the reformer or the perfectionist. Their motivation is to be virtuous, ideals-driven, and accurate. They do things the way they believe they should be done. Um, their fear is being bad, wrong, and being condemned for doing something wrong. Um, I just throw out a personal point on ones when we talk about it. Ones and sixes, I feel the most empathy for in the Enneagram because ones have a consistent single voice in their head telling them that are not good enough, that it's not perfect enough, they made a mistake, um, they need to fix something. And sixes have a committee of people telling them there's something that could go wrong. Uh, so I feel tons of empathy for ones because I can't, I have a self-critic, but it's not constant, like I imagine ones are. Um, so ones want to make everything better. They're, that's really, they walk into a room as like, what, what needs to be improved? That's what uh, their vision is. They tend to be critical of themselves and others, um, mostly themselves, in my experience. They are driven to accomplish tasks. So there's your checkmark people. They have lists that they want to get done. Um, they're really driven uh, to accomplish tasks. And they have good instincts and intuition. So um, it's probably that voice that's talking to them. So <laughs> um, I'm just going to share a quick little story. So we'll talk about our types, but Jasmine is a one. And before we came in today, she's like, can we practice this really quick? And I'm like, absolutely, because I know you need it. So that's where we've gained that empathy is I, I have experienced talking in front of groups and feel very comfortable. Jasmine needed that comfort level of practicing. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know, so yeah, I'm like, that's what our... if something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. We want to make sure nothing goes wrong. So. <laughs> All right. So the next intelligence center we're going to talk about is the heart center. 
So heart centers is where emotions are sensed and expressed. It enables you to connect with your feelings and the feelings of those around you. So they're the most empathetic um, set of Enneagram types. These types have high emotional intelligence and they focus on feelings. Their focus on feelings can manifest in fears of unworthiness and not being loved. Uh, so common among these types is a desire for meaning, value, and identity. These types also have a, chronically, a chronical sense of shame. They have to, a need to want and need approval, admiration, love, and appreciation. When these types do not receive this validation, they grow sad and become ashamed because they don't feel like we're, they're giving enough to get enough. You might be a heart center type if you make decisions based on how it makes you feel. Um, uh, just a, a spoiler alert, I'm a heart center type and I often find that I say, I feel this when we're, I'm in a conversation because I think with my emotions, um, which is a, you know not a bad thing. Like that's where we feel our intelligence and in and, and our decision-making. So you might be a heart center if you, if you find yourself doing stuff like that. So the first type in the heart centers are type twos and they are noted as the helpers or the nurturers or the caretakers are, are different terms that are used for them. They want and desire to be loved and needed by others and to feel indispensable. And they fear being unworthy of love, period. Like just unworthy of love regardless. So they want to experience deep connection. So if you have people in your life or you yourself or that really value connection and community, they might be a two. Um, they know instinctively how to serve others. Um, we tell a story about gift giving. Twos are the ones that pay attention to what you want and will write it down and, and that's what you're gifted with. They also want the same in re re return. Um, twos can burn out trying to help people all the time. And then they define themselves by other people. So they find their value in how they help others. I will say the gift story, Teresa. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Teresa here and there has sent me little things and I'm just like, oh, she thought of me. That's so sweet, right? That's literally like the, that's all I thought. We went through a session, a workshop together with a group and we talked about twos and how twos specifically uh, they put a lot of thought in their gift giving and really desire that in return. And then I would thought back and I was like, Oh my gosh, she just sent me stuff and I never sent her anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so recently for her birthday, I sent her like this very big box of stuff that I was like, I know she'll like this. I know she'll like that. I know she'll like that. So I hope I redeemed myself, Teresa. You did. You did. <laughs> All right, so the next uh, type in the heart center are threes, and they are the achievers or the performers. Um, threes desire to be valuable, wanted, and successful in whatever they do, and they fear failure and feeling worthless. So they are, their achievements are what define them and, and give that, get them love. So they are gifted with insatiable energy, like they are driven, they're probably equal or more driven than ones are driven to complete tasks. Threes could just be driven. Like they, they're very results oriented, um, driven to achieve and succeed. They adapt to different people and situations. So they're fairly adaptable um, in how they achieve and succeed in those situations. And they don't like to bother with feelings. So even though they're in the heart center, they don't like dealing with those feelings. I actually, my husband's a three and he said that he first deal, he first re has the feeling and has to push it aside to go. Like he can't think about it or feel it. So it's very true. And then fours, fours are called the individualist or the romantic. I call them the unicorn of the Enneagram because statistically uh, that we know of, they have show up the fewest times in the Enneagram types. And uh, some of the data that Jasmine and I have been doing, we have had what, one four, if that, I have to look at the, the, the stats, we'll show them at the end, but 
So uh, I call them the unicorn. So their, does, their motivation is they want to have a unique identity and meaningful significance or personal significance. So they, they want to be significant and unique. Um, they are afraid of not having an identity. So they, they will not be the type that merges with others because they want to feel unique and different. But they also crave having that connection to other people. Um, Fours feel misunderstood quite often um, because of that need for identity. They may con be considered aloof or um, introverted. Some of them are introverted. Um, they crave intensity in relationships. So they want a lot of meaningful things in their relationships. They are probably the ones that fall in love really quickly um, because they want that intensity. Are com they are comfortable with melancholy. So one of the uh, beautiful things about fours is they can sit with the uncomfortableness of their themselves. There are types that do anything they can to stay away from sad feelings. Fours embrace it and consider it as part of their unique identity. Um, and they ride a roller coaster of emotions. They can go from highs to lows in one, you know, in one sitting, like one hour. They could. Um, go from highs to lows. I'll just say, share my, I'm pretty sure my daughter is a four and uh, she, she was actually diagnosed with a, a high emotion as a kid because she could switch on a dime uh, to being really happy and euphoric and then crying and sad um, there. So I, at that time, I didn't know anything about this. So we just thought it was a very strange thing our daughter could do. But <laughs> So that is our heart centers. Moving along. I don't feel like we're doing any of these types justice, but we'll, we'll keep going. So head centers relate to rationality, analysis, and ideas, and planning and prioritizing. So all the things around facts. Um, they focus on connection with mental strength and intelligence. This is that they they try to feel prepared, knowledgeable, and safe. And the types in this triad have a desire for safety. So they are doing things to keep themselves or the people they care about as safe as possible. These types need more certainty, reassurance, and opportunities to help minimize their fears and calm their anxieties. If these types are not able to find inner peace with, and self-assurance, they will become overcome with irrational fears. Um, so our types within the head center, oh, sorry, you might be a head center type if you make decisions from knowledge or analysis. So um, if you're like, I need all this data or I need to read a book on it or I need to read an article to make a decision or I need to gather all this information, you might be a head center or have a head center in your, in your life because I see someone just say, I think I found my husband's center. <laughs> so the first one is fives. Fives are called the thinkers or the observers. Um, five's motivation is they want to be competent, autonomous, and capable. So they, they're wanting to actually, you know, just be self-reliant. Um, they fear being helpless, dependent, and incapable. So fives will show up. They have the lowest energy of all numbers because they, uh, in the readings that Jasmine and I have done, is they're conserving it for themselves. They're, they are afraid of having someone else or another situation use up their energy so there's not enough for them to do what they need to do to stay safe. Um, so they do have the lowest energy. Uh, they want to gather knowledge and resources. So, uh, you know, they have a lot of, of information to make decisions on. They can think through things without emotion. And I would say as a feelings type, I find this very difficult. It's like, how can you make a decision and not have your emotions involved? Um, I, I am uh, in a relationship with a five and I continually have to think, uh, think of this as that when I'm trying to soften messages or I overanalyze how something might sound, I have to remember he's just, 
he can separate those things. His emotions and facts are different. So, um, and they appreciate upfront expectations. So they want to know what's expected of them. They may also need some time to process information that you're giving them. A lot of the types in the spot head center will probably need uh, information and, and processing time. The next one are the loyalists, sixes. Um, so their motivation is they want support and security, period. They're just like twos want just to feel loved. Sixes want security, period. And like I said, they're the, they're the type that has the committee of voices in their head uh, that, that keeps pointing out things that might go wrong, you know, or, or danger, danger. You know, there's something ahead that might make us not feel safe or the people we care about feel safe. Um, so their fear is being without guidance and support. And a lot of the readings that we do, this is the type that also probably suffers from a lot of anxiety because they're trying to keep everything, you know, recognize what could go wrong and keeping themselves and their loved ones safe. So um, the sixes are beautiful. They hold groups and communities together. They, they have their, their tribes of people that they care about deeply. They are naturally suspicious of motives. So um, they also are probably the ones in your life that ask tons of what if questions or have you considered questions, you know? So those are the things that they uh, w might show up with. Uh, they land on a continuum of phobic and counterphobic. That is a term within the Enneagram that is kind of deep that even J Jasmine and I are just starting to dig into a little bit. Um, so I uh, won't talk a lot about that, um, but they tend to self-doubt often too. So, because, you know, of all the questions they have going on in their head. All right, and the last type that we are gonna touch on tonight is sevens. Um, sevens are called the enthusiast. And their motivation is they desire freedom, contentment, and having their needs fulfilled. And they fear being in emotional, physical, or mental pain or being deprived. So they are essentially uh, trying to avoid sadness, pain of any type. So they might uh, show up as just going from project to project or relationship to relationship, or they might be... Um, always have the ones of fear missing out. Like I, I suffer from that too. Jasmine kept thinking I was a seven, um, <laughs> but my motivation is not to avoid pain. Uh, so sevens want to experience the best parts of life. They're, you know, may have several interests that they're interested in. They feel trapped by pain and sadness. So they will do anything they can to get away from those feelings as quickly as possible. Um, they are always up for a new adventure. So if you're looking to go do something and you need a partner, find a seven in your life and they will right, be right there with you. Um, and they enjoy keeping their options open. So they may also not like commit to something in the future. They, something better might come up. And again, not terrible things about a seven. I think a lot of people test trying to be a seven because it sounds so so much fun <laughs> um so sevens are probably the really really fun people in your life although i feel like i'm really fun and i'm not a seven so <laughs> <Too good friend. laughs> so again this is just the tip of the iceberg on these types oh my gosh oh uh, we could spend hours on each one and talk about our experiences personally but we don't have that kind of time so I'm just going to jump in. We just talked a little bit that we'd share our journey and like how, how much this has impacted us. And, and even if one of you walks away tonight, like I need to find out more about the Enneagram and have a lot of the self-knowledge, Jasmine and I will feel like we had a successful night here. Um, so what made us interested? So as we, I, as we've kind of alluded to, Jasmine's a one, I'm a two. And they're right next to each other. So there's a lot of things that we could have in common. Our behaviors, as Jasmine mentioned, would show up. We have a lot of the same reactions to things. And, and, um, and we balance each other really well because we're not the same type. But how, how I kind of stumbled on this, I always say had a midlife crisis. And one of the books I read kind of even talks about how type twos will just one day wake up emotionally, physically, 
intellectually exhausted from everything that um, they they give. Like twos give a lot, and they sacrifice self care um, for the needs of others because they're trying to feel loved. That they're doing everything they can to feel loved, and so. Um, I just woke up, I did, I literally woke up one morning, I'm like, God, I'm just so tired. And I don't even remember where I stumbled across the Enneagram. I think I probably heard, heard about it in a, on the radio or in a podcast, and then it kept showing up for me. Like, it, I, I kept hearing about it. It's like when you want a red car, and then you see red cars everywhere. And so uh, I started doing some reading. I took the test. I kept testing between a nine and a two because I really hate conflict. Um, but when I read about twos and the things that motivate them and what they fear and, and the ways that they may behave to, to accomplish those motivations and fears, I, like, I literally would start crying because I'm a feeling center. So that should have been a dead giveaway. I'm not a body center. Um, so... so I, I think sometimes I think that I, re, I did this recognition maybe too late in some instances as a result. Like I went through a divorce, had some things change in my life, which I feel are good now. Um, but I've done a lot, even in some of my relationships at work um, and personal relationships, it's always that constant reminder to me that because this is the way I feel and this is how I need to um, care for other people is not how other people need to be taken care of. And so even in areas where I've had conflict with another person, um, I can still build on that empathy and know that they probably have a different motivation than I do. And so where they're coming from, I work really closely with a seven and we have not always gotten along. Um, but I, I, I keep in mind that I know I understand her motivation why she needs to move from how, why she gets through things so quickly, like, or an achiever, like very, you know, I may not always, um, we may not always connect, but I can understand where they're coming from and what's driving them to be a certain way. So I feel like that's in my relationships at work and personally, it's just really made me feel more cognizant about um, why people do things and try to work with them um, to recognize those and fulfill them um, and help them understand uh, their motivations. So that's a little bit about my story. So I'll let Jasmine kind of talk about hers. So someone, Teresa, like I said, <laughs> came to me and was like, hey, did you ever hear of the Enneagram? I think you're a two like me. I was like, oh, maybe. Why not? Which is totally the same. So I took the test and I came out as a seven. Then I read about the seven and I was like, no, that doesn't resonate with me. So I go, I was actually in Madison, Wisconsin on a business trip, having a grand old time, just like a seven would, right? So then I took the test that night and I tested as a six. So obviously some anxiety and fear was there, right? Like, wait, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Why am I testing this way, right? Did I answer them right? Did I not answer them right? Wrong. Did I answer them wrong? And I realized, and then after that, I would get that I was a two. And I told Teresa, and I was just like, yeah, but I just, the, the motivation is not the same. And so after a while, after about six months <laughs> and a lot of self-reflection and thought, I realized that um, I was very jealous of my friends <laughs> that all knew their type right off the bat. And we're just like, that's totally me. I don't want it to echo to anyone else. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was like, man, I, I mean, people would tell me that I read it or I heard about this type and I just cried or it was just like they were reading my mind. And I'm like, why is this not happening to me at all with any of these types? And I, after, after all my research, I found out that I was looking for the perfect type that fit me perfectly. And then I read type one and I hated it. I hated it completely because I didn't want to be critical. I didn't want to be judgmental. And I was like, I, didn't, I don't know like this. And it took me a really long time to accept the fact that I'm a one. I had to do self, a lot of self-awareness about what I do and why. Um, when I would ask my sisters or my husband, they're like, yeah, that's totally you. And I'm like, no, it's not. 
<laughs> so long story short, um, yeah, I'm a one. And um, I've learned that that inner critic is real. I've learned that I do. I know how to organize everything. And I hate disorganization. Like, please load the dishwasher properly because I don't want to have to go back in and do it behind you because it's not efficient. OK, that's just what goes through my mind, my mind. And so I then had my husband take it and um, I made him take it. And um, so I could find out better ways to communicate with him because we were having trouble with our communication and finding out that he was a three. I was like, oh, that's why you do what you do. And just like Teresa, once I really understood his motivation of I, I only see my worth from what I achieve, it made me have a lot of empathy for him. And so it changed how I communicate with him. And he learned more about me, which in turn, I'm not being critical of you and that you're failing. I just think I know what to do. <laughs> then I'm always right. So anyways, um, but it has had the biggest impact on my home life and at work because I've, I've begun bringing it to work. So as a scrum master, I'm trying to get my teams to work well together, to communicate effectively, to self-organize. And so we, I had them do the workshop we'll talk about later. And um, they, for me as a scrum master, when I coach each one, now I know what their motivation is and I can talk to it even with the, with the manager, with the product owner, like, hey, do you remember when we found this information out? This is probably why. And they're like, oh, that's right. They weren't trying to be mean. They weren't trying to cut people off. They were just protecting or being there, you know, go, following their behaviors based on their motivation. So I have seen a lot of uh i've seen a lot of impacts this has had positive impacts on my teams and so because of that i, I really do want to become an enneagram coach because i think that that would provide a lot of value so that's my so there's a couple of questions or comments yeah. that yeah. came in through the through the chat i don't know Teresa, yeah. if you were already checking through yep. those yep i have so, them here okay perfect yeah i All was right. going to really quickly address we've even though um we mentioned, you know, if you see some of these behaviors in your friends, they might be this or your family. Be very careful about typing someone because you don't, you don't know what their core motivation is unless they've shared mm -hmm. it with you or, yep. you know, you've had a conversation about it. So yep. um, I think what oh, Jasmine, I know what I do is this, um, I'm in, an, an, I really listen to what people say. And a lot of times I'm like, that I, I wonder if they're a three or I wonder if they're a two just based off of, or a six, just because of something they said or how they said it. And I might ask questions, to clarify, but unless they've done the work with me or, you know, have shared how they've done the work to figure it out. I, I try to be really careful about it, but it's easy to follow in that trap. It's like, oh, they must be a six or they must be a oh, seven. It's but so just hard not to recognize that you mean you don't know their true motivation. So mm -hmm. uh, unless they've told you. So I, mean, um, so I do want to talk yeah. about that. We're the prime example, Teresa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not the same. <laughs> so Laverne had asked, is it possibly two different numbers? Uh, no. Your core... You, so what the Enneagram uh, scholars would say is you Masters. have your, yeah, you have your primary motivation. That's, that is your go-to, like your, what you're trying to avoid and what motivates you. Um, what we didn't get into tonight is, is a whole plethora as you just keep peeling back the onion about the Enneagram and your, your core selves is you may wing another um number either on either side of you. So that would be your secondary fear motivation. Um, you also go to different numbers and stress and what they say health. So when you're feeling really, so I'm a two, when I'm the, my best self, I show up as the best self of, as a four. Um, but my core motivations are still, I don't want to be unworthy of love. Like I need to know that I'm valued and loved. Um, and that's what motivates me. I'm not a four. I'm not looking for a separate identity. Um, when I'm stressed, I go to eight. And so, but I don't have those motivations. I just show up as those behaviors. So you really, you, the scholars say you are one type and you are genetically set to be that one type. Your whole life. Uh, your whole life. 
I, what we don't mention here is there are obviously your life influences you. Oh, so yeah. you are born as, as a, the scholars will say, you are born as one type. It starts showing up around five years old. It's really cemented by the time you're five. But we all have trauma. We all have experiences. We all have um, things that happen in our life that shape our personalities and our behaviors. Um, but your core motivation of why you do things and how you act never changes. It gets deep. <laughs> oh, girl. Yeah. Listen, deep. There's Suzanne Stabile is like one of the Enneagram masters and she teaches an eight hour course just on the types. Mm -hmm. just so, on the, I mean, it's one deep. for each type. <laughs> one hour for each type. Yeah. So we have alluded to our workshops. So Jasmine and I decided we, Jasmine did a presentation at an internal conference that we have at Nelnet last year about communication and referenced the Enneagram. And it caused a little bit of a, an interest. Um, so she and I developed a workshop that talks about each type and what we do with each of those groups that takes or walks through the workshop with us is we ask them to take a test because it does kind of give you a starting point. Um, and then we would go through each type from a professional perspective and how they may show up. And then we would reveal how each type shows up and so, um, and asked for their questions. So, uh, or how they felt about that or how did that resonate with them? And it's just, again, it's really just an introductory for them to be thinking about who they are and who their team members might be to maybe change conversation and, and recognize why we do the things we do. So we thought it'd be interesting. We, like I said, we started kind of gathering the data to kind of see if we could start putting um, in, in perspective, like where people fall in their professions. So uh, as you can see, we've done, I think seven workshops, Jasmine is what I put. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then we work in IT, so all, but I think all of them, but the one we did with the recruiting group has been right. IT focused. And yep. so out of the five groups that we've done, nine show up the most which is really surprising, but it also reflects a lot about how getting healthy conflict and collaboration can be difficult sometimes, especially in agile teams, if most of them are nines. They are doing everything they can to avoid <laughs> conflict. And here we're telling them, conflict's healthy, collaborate, have different ideas. And they're like, no. Oh, no, they're like, no, I'll do whatever you want. No, I'll yes. do whatever you want. No, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> Um, so just some interesting things, you know, sixes, uh, five show up a lot, uh, which is really makes sense too, as far as that profession, because of the knowledge that's involved in development and testing. Um, but also, you know, detaching the emotions, like we're asking people to be team members and care about each other. And they're like, emotions don't belong at work, right? <laughs> you have yeah. some of those people there too. So, yep. um, so he, we thought we'd share the data around that. Other, other than that, like I said, no fours, no fours in IT, which isn't surprising. Um, mm -hmm. They're mostly, uh, a lot of those are creative crafts, like probably you'd find a lot in marketing. Right. Um, so we did a leadership group as well. Uh, or we pulled the leaderships out of there because a lot of these teams had like managers as part of it. Um, so less less population to put in here but we have a lot of three a lot leaders leaders show up a lot as threes and eights mm -hmm. um because they naturally feel that void in, of motivation and, and um achievement achievement thank you thank you so so threes and eights and then our recruiting group we did really exciting uh i saw tracy cried was on here so um <laughs> Uh, we did it with Tech Systems uh, Women's Group, which was super fun. Great group to do that. And look at that. Twos and threes were the majority of their group, which totally makes sense for them. Um, they're helping people find jobs. They're connecting to people. They're, um, you know, helpers, essentially, and really motivated helpers. <laughs> and so... Um, that was a lot of fun. And then all the other numbers, you know, again, no fours, 
like force. Poor force. They're the unicorns. They're the unicorns. So I'm we determined. just thought we would show that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, let's do more because they're out there. And I want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a question. How often is the first assessment correct? <laughs> good not, question. Yeah. Because not it wasn't right for me until like last year. <laughs> and I've been doing this for like two years. I think it depends, right, Teresa? Mm -hmm. um, I, so when we, uh, we were going to talk a little bit about how our approach is. So we, um, when we do the, the workshop, we take the top three. Um, and I was listening to a podcast to do, today and her, in her coaching takes, she takes the top four because it's probably somewhere in there. It's like your five strengths. Like you have some of all the strengths, but you have your top five. Um, and then, so we to look at the top three. And then as we're going through and talking about the motivations and fears, we'll ask those that fall, fell second and third in those, um, kind of like where they, how, which one is resonating with them the most. Um, I would say about 25% change throughout the course of the workshop. Jasmine, would you say roughly? Yeah, but with our workshop, I would mm -hmm. say maybe even less. I think yeah. a lot of people did say or feel they resonated with their primary type more than we thought. So I was going off of me. As, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm the unicorn on my, by myself. Yeah. Yeah. But it, the testing is really a guide. So, yeah. And then there was a question about how it's different or the same as emergent. I know Teresa's emergent done emergenetics and Myers-Briggs, but this one deals specifically with motivation and why we do certain things. And the one thing that's really awesome about the Enneagram is that it's not a tool or a system that just gives you data and says, this is who you are, go have fun. It's like, look, this is where you get your motivation from. And these could be the possible behaviors that show up for you because of this motivation. And if you want to adjust those behaviors, this is what you can do. Why don't we look at this? Why don't we look at that? You can actually do something with the Enneagram, whereas with Emergenetics and Myers-Briggs, it's just data. Mm -hmm. so. so one of the graphics we didn't include tonight is we have a graphic that aligns the different Myers-Briggs types with the Enneagram types. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I like Myers-Briggs to, you know, introvert, extrovert, where you get your energy some of the types may be more introverted. Like I think type fives can be fairly yep. introverted. Type mm -hmm. fours could probably be fairly introverted because they're looking for identity. Type um, nines. Type nines might be. So I think there's some things that can align and you show up, those behaviors show up because of your need for, you know, you're not going to expand energy on everybody else if you need it for yourself or you're avoiding conflict. So I'm just going to stay home because nobody's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. So, I'll ripple um, my pond. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Emergenetics one, it's been a long time since I've done Emergenetics. So I, again, I think it's more of like those behaviors showing up because of, mm -hmm. of your core, core desires and, and fears. So I know um, I think so, we're at are we at yep. time already? About time. <laughs> yep. So like I said, we could talk forever about this. Oh, gosh. So we will, you know, share this however, uh, however you guys share um, information. But we do have some, this is just a short list that, that Jasmine and I have come across. Um, so we have a couple podcasts that really helped us like grasp what, what each type is. So ja Jen Hatmaker did one last summer where she dug, had guest speakers from um, each type come in and kind of talk about their, their work through the Enneagram and how it showed up for them. For those of you from the 80s, Lisa Welchel from Facts of Life is on one of those episodes. She's a type three. Um, <laughs> um, and then one that we've really enjoyed is the Annie F. Downs. That sounds fun. She's done uh any a summer for the last three years i just started listening to the 2021 and this this is what really helped jasmine and i start really digging and she has a, a male and a female of each type come in and really talk about you know how how 
how shows that for impacts them. them, shows up yeah. for them. That one is a little bit more spiritually based. So uh, the Enneagram is aligned with Christianity and spirituality too. So uh, that one does dig a little bit more closer to s- s- the spiritual side. Uh, the three books, uh, which are some of the ones that we'll be giving away tonight, um, are The Honest Enneagram. Oh, the en- oh yep. <laughs> Enneagram. By Sir Jane Case. The Road Back to You, which was the first book Jasmine and I really started digging in, and then the Enneagram and You, which I find have found this one incredibly valuable as more of a textbook around the Enneagram. And then a couple websites. So all the graphics tonight we uh, got from Enneagram Megan off of Instagram. She, you'll find a lot of Enneagram stuff on Instagram um, around behavior around behaviors tied to the motivations your Enneagram coach with Beth Beth McCord McCord. and then the Enneagram Institute is actually one of the more scholar heavy um, Mm -hmm. references there's also one called Enneagram at work uh, which Mm -hmm. is one I think I've directed a couple people to that kind of helps you from a work perspective and they do offer coaching and stuff through workplaces. But so, and there are other podcasts, books, websites. Um, These are just the ones that Jasmine and I have utilized in the, in the near past to get our data. And I know we're out of time, but I just wanted to make sure that we knew that there is a typo. Okay. (laughs) Was it me? Well, in the, I just want to be sure whoever watches the recording, um, every, every credit for each type, we're just missing an N with Enneagram Megan. You saw that too. (laughs) You're not a one. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, what? (laughs) (sighs) Sorry. No, 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 I'm not a one. (laughs) (laughs) Sonia saw it on every page. (laughs) All right, now I gotta quit. Figure out how to quit sharing. <laughs> so, which which of these would you, or where would you recommend? What tests would you take? Is that on one of those websites? If you wanted to take a test to discover your type, is that where so you would go? A, there's a so, free test on Truity, True T R U I T Y, mm-hmm. yep. that we recommend a lot. Um, mm-hmm. They do a lot. They have a lot of the personality tests on there that you can mm-hmm. use. So they do the Enneagram. You can pay to get like deeper results, mm-hmm. but it's a good free one. Um, Susan Enneagram Stabile. Inst- yep. I was going to say the Enneagram Institute has one that's like 12 bucks. Yep. Sorry, and so $12. Does your, and your Enneagram coach has a free one as well. So the thing to think, think about if you, when you take the test, is to really think about the way you feel, like the way you should answer it, not the way you want to answer it. Mm-hmm. So thinking of it from a true perspective, we had one workshop where our actually our CIO was in there and he took it twice because he took it, didn't send us the results. So he had to take it again. And he took the first one right before he was on uh, time off ETO and came out, like an eight, I think. I think it was a nine. Nine. Yep. And then when he came back, he took it again, probably more relaxed, feeling more himself and came out a three. And so again, your mindset, you can kind of game, you know, be careful not to game it to where you want to go mm-hmm. um, or how you think you should answer the question to get a truer result. And to stick with the, 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 the triads. There's also an instinct that each of us have with that motivation. So trust your instinct and don't second guess it. So whatever you first think is the best answer, just pick it. Don't even think about twice about it. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I did. <laughs> so great, great advice. And so it sounds like we've got a lot of, a lot of good resources that we can go to and just like Google Enneagram mm-hmm. test. And I, when I did that, Trudy did show up as, as an option to, to do. So thank you guys so much for doing that. Is there a a way if people want to follow up with you is do you have should they follow you on twitter or what's the, what's <laughs> well, the i wish i was twitter worthy like that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're totally twitter worthy so you're totally twitter worthy uh, no we so, can provide our our email addresses uh linkedin i'm actually probably I'm not t- i'm not a twitterer i i don't know if that shows uh, it's my least favorite social media outlet i probably linkedin is a great place to catch me and i yeah, I check that quite often. So 
I don't okay. know how to do Twitter, right? So I can't. There. <laughs> all, all good. It's good to know your strengths, right? And so, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes I, I, I don't tweet myself either. So I do want to go ahead and make sure because we are um, art time. We're getting a lot of good feedback on the channel too of, of thank you and great job. And I totally endorse those comments as well. I want to share my screen real quick so that we can do the name picker for who will get the books.